This is uh, Morten from Inkish TV and uh, we are here at uh, the second last episode today or session that I'm doing here uh, as what we call uh, Inkish over the Skype. Um, the gentleman that I'm going to talk to, he's from Virginia in the US. So uh, in, uh, just a few moments ago we were in Germany and now we're going to, uh, to uh, Virginia in the US on the East Coast uh, near to Washington DC. And um, this gentleman is working for uh, the organization AP Tech. And uh, one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to him was simply because when I met uh, Ken Garner uh, in uh, India uh, one and a half year ago at uh, Printpack India, I felt that uh, we could talk forever. So uh, do you agree on that uh, introduction, uh, Ken? <laughs> Yeah, that's a great introduction, and uh, yeah, it's just, uh, I, I think uh, we we could speak forever here, but we've got, I'm sure, a limited amount of time. Yeah, so um, before we go talk about any topics we, we, you and I can figure out to talk about, can you talk about a little bit, or tell them, uh, the audience a little bit who you are and what you do? Yeah, so I am currently the Senior Vice President for Content Development for AP Tech. Uh, and so the association, most associations kind of live and die on the basis of the quality and relevancy of the content they create. So I have uh, the great uh, fortune to work with a great team at AP Tech uh, to create the content that we think is unique, relevant, and compelling to our members. And right now, it's a very interesting time in the sense that uh, we're going through some interesting challenges. So much of our content is related to that. But uh, a lot of the content that we create, I would say the overwhelming amount of content we create is beyond just COVID-19 and really kind of... Uh, how our how our members can stay in business, transform, adapt, and innovate uh, to continue to create a sustainable competitive advantage. That's a lot of what we do. Mm. And um, uh, for those who don't know what AP Tech is, that is uh, 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 that's an organization in the U.S. that lived from uh, NPSC. It was called in the in the in the past, and and it changed yes. name. Like I think it's like three, four years, maybe five years ago? Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, AP Tech is short for the Association for Print Technologies, which is a rebrand from MPES. And I think most people would know MPES, who existed uh, as MPS. We existed for over 50 years as MPS, uh, as the uh, principal manager and, and one-third owner of uh, the Print and Graph Expo. Uh, franchise. And so uh, we really were heavy into uh, the trade show, but also at that time exclusively served the OEM community. Mm. Uh, and then about three years ago, as you mentioned, uh, we rebranded and re began a process of repositioning ourselves and opened up the membership to service providers, print service and, and mailing service providers. So uh, we're a bit larger now in terms of the scope and breadth of what we do, but uh, uh, kind of anxiously looking towards the future. And uh, has it been more fun to develop into those new directions? Well, actually, you know, I wouldn't be part of AP Tech if we hadn't done that because <laughs> my background really is is as a printer. Uh, I've been in the industry for over 40 years now, um, and 33 of that was building a company that became a rather sizable uh, magazine printing company, Heat Set Offset Web uh, Magazine Printing Company. And then in 2008, uh, transitioned into the association world and spent some time running a company or an association called MFSA, Mailing Fulfillment Service Association, which I then drove to merge with NAPL to form an association called Epicom, which I then drove to uh, merge with ID Alliance and then uh, ultimately wound up here at AP Tech. And it's great fun. I'm, I'm really happy to be here we've got a great team we're doing great work we have i i have made countless interviews with thay along he's one of uh, of the people in in the in the u.s i really like uh, i think uh, i think that you know i feel you know maybe i shouldn't feel sorry for him and, and of course uh, because but sometimes i feel a little bit sorry because i thought that the trade show was you know that's like very visual kind of uh uh, stamp of uh, of your work, uh, but I think that he's actually happy that now you are um, changing direction into something that is uh, way more focused on the future of the printing industry. Because I know he's very passionate, and I think that when I, when I listen to you, I think that you are a good match with him, right? Oh, I love working with Thayer. He's a great leader. I'm I'm, I'm really happy to be part of his team. And yes. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, that we have uh, created a great vision for AP Tech, and it is uh, much more broad, uh, broadly focused, more diversified in what we do. 
uh, if to a broader audience. And I think really what drives all of us at this stage of our careers is how we can make a positive impact on this industry that's been so good to us through so many years. And uh, we really want to make sure that uh, that the future for the uh, for the industry is bright and and secure and solid. And so that's the that's the work that we're doing. And it's good work and it feels good to do. Mm. I remember uh, the last time I met uh, Thea, that was at Label Expo in Brussels. And I made an interview with him at that time as well. And um, I believe that that as if I recall it correctly, it was like uh, that one of the concerns that he has is sometimes that that. And I know we're not going to talk too too much about him since he's not joining us. But <laughs> but I'm just saying that as as, we, as I recall, his concern was that uh, instead of trying to have the short term gain, we should also look at the long term gain, and that is by educating. By uh, I think he was using the word um, uh, idealizing uh, things, and you know to yeah get, ideation yeah uh, ideation yes, yeah, and and yeah. to and to uh, uh, help the industry by. Uh, educating by uh, uh, really uh, um, increasing the the knowledge level is that, is, is that is that, do I remember right? <laughs> yeah, you do. You're you're you have it exactly right. So, you know, really, as we look towards the future and uh, really want to help uh, script the future for the industry. Um, we also believe that we need to change a bit of the mentality and the perspective of the industry and move it a little bit way f- uh, away from uh, an exclusive focus on manufacturing and really uh, talk about how we create value for customers. Mm. Okay, And that value is going to manifest itself in a number of ways, not just uh with ink on paper, but in lots of different ways where print finds uh, a way to create value in the world and in society and among communities. And so, uh, yeah, uh, this is this is a big part of our mission as we go forward, which is to kind of expand the vision and really think about, again, what we do, how we do it in a way that creates value for people, for communities, for society, and a really, uh, in some ways, uh, more of a, a business perspective, but it all begins with uh, an intimate understanding of customers and what they want, what problems they experience so that we as uh, providers can be solvers, Mm. solution providers for those problems. So it's, again, it's great work and it's fun to do. But it's uh, also sound to me like a tremendously huge task to, to take on because one thing is that you can create valuable content. I don't question that at all. I don't question that you can get it out to inform the industry either but both to do the research and understanding uh, the needs and also evaluating and 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 thinking about how the future will be and to because it sounds almost like a, a mission for a mentality change among the 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 leaders of the the printing companies in in, in the industry and, and that that sounds like something that you don't do overnight right no, it's not a it's not a task overnight. And by the way, it's just not a task. It's an ongoing kind of commitment. Yeah. Uh, so it's not a, a situation like a, a, an initiative that has a specific beginning and a specific end. And it's also not something that we understand we can do alone. Hmm. Uh, one of the things I really enjoy about AP Tech is we really have open arms to participate and work with anybody who has something to contribute to this process. And uh, the more good minds that we aggregate uh, towards this uh, vision and, and towards this end, the better we think we're going to be. Uh, and, and even reaching outside of the industry, you know, one of the things that uh, we recognize is so much of what we create and so much of the direction that we plan for ourselves is very internal. We're very singular in this industry, okay? Mm-hmm. Very parochial kind of an echo chamber. And so one of the things that we've done is look outside. How can we partner with people outside our industry to get things that we can learn from other experiences, other benchmarking opportunities? So I've begun to work with a major university here that has a graduate school of business. And one of our big initiatives coming up is to launch a nine-week program around uh, business transformation, cool. industry transformation that's going to be created, is has been created, and will be delivered by graduate-level professors. So we have that academic level, a graduate level, academic level that doesn't exist currently in in the industry, but also the outside experience and perspective that we can bring. And then we have integrated into that very much the culture of the printing industry. So we have this interesting mixture 
uh, perspective that we're going to share through this program. But it's again, it's about being smarter, wiser, and and really kind of more expansive in the strategic look of what we do and how we do it. Mm. I like uh, I like uh, that you say that you have like this open approach to uh, to anybody who wants to con- contribute to the uh, let's say the to that agenda, basically, right? Um, I was yeah. I was wondering um, when you when you don't have the trade show anymore, right? right. Uh, I was just thinking that that might actually open up an opportunity because, you know, uh, the last days of, to be honest, the fight between you and, and, and uh, the competitors in the market was not really pretty to look at, right? But now when you have like divided <laughs> the, the X and the two yeah. different sides, now it seems that that could open up for even a, a broader collaboration. Is, is that how you see it also or... Yeah, I think that, uh, again, uh, one of the things that we would like to envision is an industry that really um, works together more effectively. And I again, I've got 40 years, more than 40 years in this industry. Some of that time was spent as chairman of NAPL at one point in time. So I've been active in a variety of, of trade association boards, including PIA. And I, m- my frustration throughout that four decades has been that as an industry, we've really never been able to kind of act aggregate our voice in a way that is appropriate, responsible, and powerful. Mm. We are a huge industry with enormous impact, contribute a lot to GDP in the U.S. here. And yet we act many times as a uh, factionalized industry, many voices, too many voices going too many different directions, and we lose the opportunity to to aggregate that power and really influence the outcome for ourselves and for others. And so, yeah, I think, you know, those of us who have been in this long enough would like to park some of those parochial uh, perspectives and say, okay, We've got an industry that has been going through significant change. It's consolidated. Uh, it is it is really kind of kind of winnowing down to the point where I think we can do some significant work. But it's got to be different, and it's got to be a different kind of vision for the future. But we need everybody to contribute to a, a successful path forward. So yeah, uh, we have open doors, open arms uh, for for most anybody who would like to come to the table and make a contribution. Mm. It's uh, I, that I, it's a great uh, great uh, vision and a great saying you have there. Uh, it's funny because I think that from a European perspective, it's kind of funny. We have to live with twenty uh, eight different languages and twenty eight different legislations and twenty eight different things of everything yeah. right and then sometimes we look at uh, the vendors in the in america and say that oh they're so fortunate they can produce in one language they can ship out to a, a bunch of uh, printing companies uh, all over the country and and you can communicate in a more uniform way because you <laughs> have the same mother tongue and then uh, and then you start looking into the organizations i think that even in europe with 28 different countries we are way more uh, harmonized <laughs> in the organizations we have uh, smaller federations in each country and we we join uh, the the when it comes to labor and environment and legislation into uh, intergraph and in the us you just have so many different organizations seem yeah. to have different agendas right <laughs> Yeah, well, in some way, the uh, I, I don't know that our vision is one organization to serve all needs. Uh, one of the things I've learned is that uh, trying to be all things to all people is not necessarily a, a prescription for success. I, I think that the industry can successfully and effectively support some multiple uh, associations because they serve niched needs, specific focus for specific communities within the industry. But I think as multiple organizations serving some specific needs for specific communities within the overall industry, we do need to at some point and at some level come together and say, okay, uh, while we represent some diverse communities here within industry, we really have to create a vision that kind of is an umbrella vision that that really is in the best interest of the industry. Mm. It's funny that you mentioned that because um, I interviewed uh, Monday this week, I interviewed uh, uh, Thomas Torp, and he is uh, the the president of the Federation of Printers in Denmark, a very tiny little organization compared to the U.S., mm-hmm. of course. But he told he spoke about the thing that um, when he started, he came from outside the industry, and he was saying that okay, we have a decreasing uh, 
a number of members. Uh, the industry in general is decreasing. We need to find out how we can become more important and relevant also yes. so we have political influence. So he actually created the umbrella organization. So the designers, the uh, the FESPA community, and, and uh, even uh, a lot of other federations were joined in that umbrella organization. I think that is it resonates to me similar to what you're saying, right? Yeah, it is. Uh, and I, I think, again, wherever our industry exists across the world, uh, we understand the, the need to, again, I think, create – a very different vision for what we do, how we do it, and the value that we create. Uh, but if there's one thing that we've learned, I think, through COVID-19 and this uh, particular challenge is uh, the global nature of business in the world and what we do and oh, how yeah. mm-hmm. something that happens on one side of the planet will impact something on the other side of the planet. And uh, you can't build walls and you can't uh, build moats and you can't protect yourself uh, from uh, from that. We are a global economy, a global world. And, you know, uh, I think the challenges that we face are, are uh, very consistent across that. And, and so the, the more time we spend working together as opposed to competing and working separately, the more we do that, the faster we're going to find some uh, incredible solutions and some, uh, you know, incredible opportunities here. Mm. So, um, yeah. the, the, the final question I have in, with this subject is uh, uh, all the changes that, that you just described that uh, AP Tech has changed into. Uh, I think that's really, uh, really a, a good and productive path you have chosen there. Um, but I was also wondering, it is, it's actually a tremendously big uh, change in uh, how uh, MPS and, uh, and AP Tech is now perceived, right? Because when you were more like a federation of uh, f- uh, specifically for, for OEMs and vendors in, in, the, in the American market, uh, you are now opening up towards memberships uh, for, uh, for uh, 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 print service providers of all kinds. And I think that also from a communication perspective, that must be... Uh, challenge to because you now have a, a different uh, objective basically right yeah uh it's interesting in the, despite the fact that we've been uh, around as an organization for well over 50 years now um we view ourselves as a startup Wharton. Uh, are startups. <laughs> we are a startup and so it's interesting in the sense that uh again uh We've got this great team, but uh, some of us have been around a long time. And to find ourselves in this startup world with the kind of challenges that that young organizations have and uh, around branding and around value proposition development and uh, go to market strategies and figuring out how we create a – you know, our own unique kind of value and differentiate ourselves. Uh, Those are all kinds of things that uh, we've had some practice at over a number of years, but uh, we are a startup and uh, it's, it's both challenging and uh, there are sleepless nights that are part of that process, but it's also exciting and filled with opportunity. So it takes a lot of energy. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I can tell it, you. I can tell you. Inkish is now six years old, and I, I consider myself a startup still. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. actually, I actually like um, you know. Sometimes startups is like in a in a beginning phase, of course. But I think that today business is all about reinventing yourself, uh, analyzing a situation. Uh, not adapting to a situation, but take advantage of the situation, developing new services, new ideas. Like, as I explained to you before we uh, started filming, uh, uh, all the Skype, uh, I would much rather prefer to sit down with you and have a dinner and drink a glass of wine and just chit-chat with each other. But since we can't do that, this the technology gives us new opportunities to even broaden our conversation to other people that might be interested in it, right? Yeah, we did yesterday, uh, we did a uh, conference uh, that was going to be a face-to-face conference uh, that we switched to virtual here on a quick pivot. Had over 400 uh, participants wow. across the world. Wow. And the main theme was business transformation, okay, yeah. and uh, and how we adapt and, and that Im- important notion of self-renewal on an ongoing basis. Uh, you just can't continue to do the same thing indefinitely and expect to, to live. I mean – 
uh, one of the statistics that was cited was small businesses here in the U.S. have a life expectancy of about eight and a half years, Morton. And really? so, okay. yeah, and even S&P companies uh, over a long period of time, their life expectancy and tenure has declined steadily and will is expected to continue to decline. So what is the answer to that? The answer to that is innovation on an ongoing basis, uh, the ability to adapt, adapt and transform, creating cultures uh, that are all focused on self-renewal on, a, on an ongoing basis basis. So that's a fun topic for us, but it is a reality. Mm. Uh, but back to your point about technology, we, we could never have done that uh, with that large a group spread over the, the geographic boundaries that uh, that we encountered yesterday w- without the, the technology that we have available to us today. So it was it was new for us as a first virtual event, a few glitches, but uh, it, it, it came off okay. And so it was a lot of fun, a lot of challenge, but uh, at the end of the day, good work. And it was all, we didn't charge for it. Uh, again, this is part of a commitment to an industry that uh, we feel strongly about. Mm. It's uh, funny that you mentioned that this of going electronic with things, because uh, I don't know if it started to balance, but but you remember when, when the internet came, uh, the advertising revenue revenue models were completely different when you went online advertising compared to uh, trade media or magazines in general yeah. and yeah. i was just wondering if uh, because uh, the content costs the same whether it's online or offline right? <laughs> <It does. laughs> yeah so i'm just wondering if people will be ready to in the future to also uh, contribute and pay for for content that is delivered via Zoom or Skype or conference systems is like, or there will be same, similar tendencies of, of uh, sliding prices when it comes to electronic kinds of uh, uh, yeah. events. I think there will be, Morton. So just let's just take this event that we did and we pivoted to virtual. If it was face-to-face and the speakers and the expenses and the venue and the hotel and the travel – you know, all those expenses have to be covered when you have an in-person event. Yeah. Uh, what we had yesterday, there was no travel, you know, there was no hotel, no uh, food and beverage expense. All those traditional expenses disappear. And so I think that uh, while we can't continue to give content away for free, none of us can. Uh, there needs to be tra- at the same time, some of the expense associated with it on face-to-face events disappears as well. So perhaps there is a, a sliding scale. But I will go back to something you and I talked about before, too, which is there will never, ever be a total substitution for the value of a face-to-face gathering. I think people like to be parts of communities. And part of that community experience is on occasion getting together face to face and really kind of just sharing in a way that is much more difficult to do. Creating that engagement level is much more difficult to do as we're doing now, Mm. as opposed to if we were sitting in the same room, sitting in two chairs, looking at each other. And uh, it's just different. But back to your point, I think there will be a sliding scale and uh, we'll see how all that settles out. Yeah. And it's funny that you mentioned that I heard somebody, I can't remember who spoke about that. Uh, I think I have actually talked to more people uh, in the past two months than I have done in any other two months period. Right. And, I, and I wouldn't say that I feel lonely because I have my wife and my kids around me here, of course. But I haven't, I haven't seen many people in, in person in, in those two months that we have been uh, in, not in quarantine and maybe not in a complete lockdown. But I saw my mom, she was sitting out there in a chair and I was sitting two meters away from her uh, yeah. <laughs> with the safety zone, thing like that. And I think that one, one person mentioned that uh, the social contact now adds a dimension that we rarely talk about. That is the physical, uh, maybe not the fact that we touch each other or shake hands or give each other a hug or something like that. But the fact that we have a three-dimensional presence, maybe. Yes. Yeah, it is. I mean, again, I, I'm an old school kind of guy. And w- one of the great pleasures when I had my uh, printing operation and we had around at my peak, I had around 300 people. The most fun I had every day was getting up from behind my desk and walking the plant floor and just making human contact with uh, with people that I had grown up with in the business and, and that were part of uh, my operation. 
and knew them personally, asking them about their kids, asking them about the house they just moved into, whatever it is. Oh, somebody just uh, had to go to the hospital. That kind of engagement is is hard to replace. And now we're quarantined. And, and uh, so I hardly ever even see our AP Tech team face to face anymore. And I miss it a great deal. Yeah, I, but uh, I think one of the great questions that everybody has to ask themselves now, Morton, is what is the new normal going to be like? Mm-hmm. Because I suspect uh, that, uh, you know, what we enjoyed before in terms of the actual physical presence in a working environment is likely to shift forever now and uh, not be quite the same as it was before. But for all of the people that are part of our industry, uh, I think that's a great question for them to be able to explore now. What's the new normal going to be like when we get to the other side of this? And where are the opportunities that are associated with that new normal that uh, I can leverage and optimize to, uh, to my organization's advantage? Mm. I can tell you that, uh, uh, of course, I, I also speculate about the new normal in, in that context. But... I'm, you know, uh, I don't know. You probably have that in the U.S. as well, but in Europe, we have. I think it's called MOMI, which is like a database that registers all uh, reasons for why people die. So you have like, uh, you know, all sicknesses, all everything, right? Um, and uh, the latest numbers that came out uh, to one one and a half week ago was actually that the total death number in Europe is lower than in in a non COVID nineteen time, right? Yeah, I, you know, again, I we're human beings, yeah. okay, and uh, and I think we are driven to create relationships. Yeah, but the and, the reason the reason I say this is because I had uh, an interview or conversation like this with uh, uh, with uh, um, uh, Cindy uh, Van Leuk from uh, Chili Publish uh, a couple of hours ago, and uh, uh, she said to me, "So, how do you think the thing will be after?" Uh, the coronavirus or when we get back to more normal thing and I think it it is also a decision that we do from from between humans because you know passing the street is uh, dangerous right putting in going into a cruise ship is dangerous uh, yeah. uh, entering an airplane is dangerous and and I think that the social acceptance of danger is in relation to the chance of getting uh, a disease for example so I said to her, and we agreed on it because I think we're both very social people, and and we usually usually when we meet, uh, I would give her a hug, and we decided that we will do that afterwards also. Yeah, I, and I, but you're right; it's going to be an individual decision uh, that people make, and you know, I as as uh, would, reluctant would, as would, I would am you, to, would you shake my hands next time I see you, or? You know, I would again. I would be inclined to shake a hand of a person that I knew. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. Uh, you know, if it's a complete stranger, I, it's going to be. It, listen, it's a two way street. Mm-hmm. Morton, if you're comfortable in shaking my hand, I'm I'm comfortable in shaking your hand, and so I we, think we'll so be we just take, fine. So we take the chances on a fifty fifty basis. That's what you say, right? <laughs> we say. We don't we don't force we don't force each other to shake hands. Yeah, right? yeah, but if I'm if I'm meeting somebody for the first time, I might be a little more reluctant now than I would have been in the past. I mean, my first inclination to meeting somebody I hadn't met before would be extend my hand and uh, and uh, and shake it. Uh, so it's it, like this is the thing. What is the new normal going to be like? Yeah. And uh, it's going to take some adjustment. And and, and I, you time, know, of course, if if we uh, if this is the first kind of crisis of this nature that we have, and and there will be others to come, perhaps, uh, perhaps more likely, mm. uh, we're going to have to make adjustments in terms of of how we physically interact with each other. But uh, and and younger people. Will set their own standards and norms, and and uh, old guys like me will still be uh, kind of captured in the past, and and still miss the days if if handshakes go the way of uh, the horse and buggy. I, I still will, I still will want with some people. I'll reserve the the right to shake their hand and yeah. uh, and give them a hug if yeah. uh, if if they're so inclined. Mm. I can tell you one of the interesting things that um, uh, my business development manager Henrik and I spoke about today, uh, because we have of course uh, uh, spoken with a lot of. people people over the past couple of weeks also to ensure that there's still some inkish afterwards and um, I can tell you quite interesting thing is that I think a lot of people have been a little bit surprised uh, uh, you know the postponing of Drupa for example right 
I think that Drupal as the biggest trade show in the world has been like the uh, the four years uh, of recurring yeah. things has been also the right. de development uh, time for introducing new products. We have talked to all oh, this this week. I think I got maybe seven, maybe eight uh, huge companies uh, in the industry saying that we will never go back to develop around a trade show because when a trade show is postponed, like the one uh, Drupal for an event uh, and for the time that we are just uh, because of a, a corona or a virus uh, all our business basically stops so so that will that will for sure i believe change yeah uh the go-to-market strategies for all companies that have in the past used trade shows as a major part of their go-to-market uh, their marketing and sales strategies uh they're going to have to rethink this but oems in the u.s and and uh, everywhere have been I think uh, hedging their bets against trade shows for some time by building their own demo centers. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so instead of picking up a lot of equipment and taking it to some place along with a huge team of people that you need to support that equipment, you, you build a good demo center somewhere. It houses your administrative functions as well as uh, the ability to demonstrate your equipment. And you bring people there. You control everything, the humidity, the environment, uh, everything about it. It's a perfect working environment to demonstrate your equipment. So, you know, I, I think that that, uh, that, has, uh, that shift has been going on for some time. I know at, at Print 18, one of the things we had was a, a virtual reality demonstration. Oh, really? Okay. So, and, and so it, we had a press there and we had a VR kind of demo of the press. Now, I, I, again, in, in my experience, I bought a fair amount of uh, press equipment and – I can tell you that that VR experience to me was far superior to watching a press operate and standing 20 feet away in a cordoned off area, watching a crank off impression somewhere. Um, being able to get inside that press, open up the side panels through VR, okay, looking at all the gears, the bearings, the rollers, all the internal parts of it, fascinating to me. Uh, the only thing that was missing was looking at the final product, which also could be added to uh, to a VR experience. Could, so it's or interesting. You could, or you could have shipped it in advance or afterwards yeah, to get absolutely. it, so you could you could sit uh, quietly and and look at it and compare it maybe to what you already have. Right? Uh, there's yeah, a lot a of uh, opportunities there. I think the bo the point I'm trying to make is technology has a way to uh, kind of disintermediate a lot of things as we go forward. And uh, so it's going to be interesting. But I, I again, the common and I, I always go back to this. There will always be the need for some type of event that brings people together physically, I think. But uh, whether or not uh, we'll see a return to trade shows, whether it's Drupal or others that that are exactly the same, same scale, same scope. That's that's for customers and and uh, and providers of solutions to decide. And that that will of course be very exciting because a lot of people are vesting on on uh, on, on having the trade shows. Of course, um, yeah. you know that's not your business, not my business anymore, right? So uh, from that perspective, uh, we can we we don't care about trade shows for a moment. However, I want yeah. to, the final subject I want to touch in, upon before we close for today is uh, when you and I, we met in India, that was in, in a city called Greater Noida, just yeah. 25, 30 miles outside of New Delhi. Uh, that was uh, <laughs> talking about germs and talking about different <laughs> potential, the health risk when you're not grown up in that uh, society is yeah. of course something that is quite interesting. But you know, one of the things that I really liked about it was that you remember that garden party? <laughs> yes. What, yes. do you, what do you think of that? Because that was like, uh, I, yeah, when you go to a trade show in Europe or in America, that is not part of the agenda to have a outside, uh, outdoor show with thousands of people and outdoor food service in that sense. And I, I don't know if you know that, but uh, I, I heard from uh, from uh, uh, Ready Dayacre that the rock band was actually in... Uh, uh, to please the Western people coming in there. <laughs> and, and, and I found it was a little bit funny to hear it because it yeah. was not the kind of music that I normally listen to. <laughs> yeah, well, it's true. That was a cover band that uh, was playing a lot of Western uh, classic rock. But, mm. you know, I really enjoyed that experience, okay? Yeah. I, I don't know whether we could ever replicate it now given the, the situation and conditions, but... Uh, 
uh, it was an event that extended beyond the trade show. Yeah, and okay? that was extended a really the fun was to an be outdoor there. event, as you recall. And I, I, it, it was great fun. And and to watch the others, I mean, watch people who were really part of the the enormous printing industry in India, and how they interacted and how they created their community. It was very impressive, but. You know, it's going to be hard to tell whether or not uh, that would be something that people would be comfortable with in the future. Yeah, that's for sure. So, um, though it was maybe not the most positive ending note, <laughs> I would yeah. still uh, like to thank you very much for your time here with English or the Skype, Ken. Uh, I wish you and AP Tech and Thayer and all the nice people at AP Tech all the best with your venture. And uh, uh, again, thank you very much for your time. Oh, it's my pleasure, Morton. And uh, the thing I look forward to uh, greatly is an opportunity for us to have a share an adult beverage sometime and and uh, be looking across the table and, and having a handshake in the process. Can't wait. <laughs> Thank you, Ken. Thank you.